And it's Wednesday. It's 6 p.m. So that means that we're on Instagram Live. And this week, I've got an amazing, amazing DJ joining me. Fabio. Hi, Sarah. Good to see you. Groove Connections in the house. Hello, everyone. Easy new flow. How's it going? Thank you for joining me on this wonderful, well, miserable Wednesday afternoon. So today I'm talking to Fabio and here we go. Let's see if this connects. Is it going to connect? It's connecting. Easy, sir. That's what I'm saying, bro. What How's it going? Saying? Not too bad. Not too bad. Not too bad. I'm just, I'm such a novice on, on things like this. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just just following you and going, bro. Because I'm sitting down there looking at the screen like, okay. I don't know what to do. I don't know. I don't know. No, yeah, exactly. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's a new world, bro. But you know, you're the professional before any of us. So for people, for people that are joining me on this week's chat, this is Fabio, the legendary Fabio, who's essentially one of the co-creators and the co-inventors of drum and bass, essentially. Like you, you Groove, invented a whole genre that changed the world. Mm. Yeah, and, for real. and you're one of the most nicest legends I've ever met in my life. Like you could, like with all due respect, and forgive me for saying this, but you could easily be a wanker, and you're not. You're so awesome, and you're so like, <laughs> like so safe. Me being so nice is a myth, man. People that know me really well, and that's a myth, bro. Trust me. But okay, Sarah on the Groove Connection account is saying that your mic's a little bit unclear. Are you covering up the mic by any chance? Do you think? I don't think so. Um, okay. I can hear you a bit better now, actually, yeah. Yeah. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, uh... Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, that's I can hear you now, bro. Yeah. Yeah, that's all right. So you being nice, nice as a myth, I mean, not from my experience, because I was just like, you know, the first time... So I was on Radio 1 for a bit, Fab and Groove obviously had their big Radio 1 show, which was the drum bass show across the world. And in all honesty, you could have been so dismissive but you were so welcoming and so like full of advice and full of like you know encouragement it was amazing so i've experienced nothing but niceness from you sir i remember i remember when you guys joined i remember um you and bobby no no, no it's bobby man us brown people you don't guys the same. At the same time no it was bobby and Nahal and norman um, deco didn't it so bobby and Nahal started oh of course yeah we don't. Yeah. Look, I mean, all all brown people don't look the same, bro. <laughs> <laughs> don't even go there, bro. This ain't this, this ain't the right time to talk about that kind of shit. But um, I do remember when you because I remember. Um, oh, of course, it was Nihal. Oh my god, yeah, yeah. Nihal and Bobby Digit. It was you and Deco, didn't it? You know what I mean? But it was yeah. a. It was a good time though at Radio One. It was it was good times at Radio One then, man. It it really felt fresh and it felt alive and it felt like they were experimenting and they were really trying to um you know break the norm of of of, of you know the, the way things were with, which was very stale for years. You know, BBC was really stale up until the point where they. You know what? To be fair, Andy Parfit changed a lot of lot of things there. Andy yeah. Parfit was a visionary man, and he, he was he was he was he had a vision to change it and he, he, to make it. You know, the thing is, pirate radio was so big, and I think they wanted to give a little kind of pirate radio come BBC kind of vibe. But they had no um, choice because they were a national platform, and who to, who else to get into do a drum and bass show than the Godfathers themselves? You and Groove, do you know what I mean? It just made made sense. Yeah, but you know when it started? When it started, it was one in the jungle. Right. It was one in the jungle. What what happened was one in the jungle was like an open platform. So what they did, they had the show called One in the Jungle, and they had various, they had different DJs every week. They had MCs because they wanted to create this real pirate style. So I think they had you know some. Say Frosty with MC Debt one week, and then the next week they'd have DJ Ron, and it was like that. They were trying a real rads pirate radio kind of thing. So on they a did that thing. thing. Yeah, on a rotation. They did it on rotation, mm -hmm. and um, after about a year, they decided um, not to do it that way anymore, and they were going to scrap the show. Okay. Can you remember Wilbur? You know Wilbur, Wilbur Wilberforce. Wilbur. Oh, do you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know Wilbur from Radio 1, man. He's a legend. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, He was with us at Kiss. 
Kiss FM. Yeah. And uh, he moved over. He got head on into Radio 1. And basically what Radio 1 was doing at the time was just poaching DJs. And um, he begged them to, to carry on with the show, to do a, a, a jungle show. Yeah. And they were really hesitant. They were kind of like, well, we don't think one in the jungle worked out. Mm. So in the end, they were like, look, is, is there any way you could get Goldie, Fabian Groove Rider? And um, so we went in for a pilot and it just didn't work out, man. It just Three big personalities like that. It, we were just talking over each other. I, I was going to say. Just, it, was, it, it was a mess. It was like, an absolute like mess. Be, being at a gig with G is impossible to get a word in edgeways anyway. Like, That's not what I'm radio. Like, that's what I'm saying. So on radio, with the three of us, kind of like all kind of fighting for the mic, it just didn't work. So we were like, as, as soon, you know when you do something and you know it didn't work? We were like, wow, that didn't work out. Yeah. And then um, they called us and said, is it possible for me and Groove to come in um, and do, do a pilot? And the rest of his history, really, he was there for 14 years, which is, that's, that's never going to be done again. That's, never, that's history, bro. You know what I mean? That, that ain't going to be done again. But, but speaking about history, right? So, I mean, like, you know, going back to, say, the days of Rage, like the very foundation, the formations of drum and bass and jungle was at your club, innit? With Groove. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, I've got the 30 Years of Rage album playing. You had your Rage, you know, uh, with, like, night um, sort of, I don't want to say throwback, but you're kind of, you know, your anniversary party, let's say, about Rage. Mm -hmm. Could you just tell me about how all that happened? Because literally, hearing drum and bass for the first time was a, a mind-blowing experience for me, but... You guys laid the foundations. Like, what, how? Well, what happened was we we knew um, we got a hookup. And Rage at the time was, uh, let's get it straight, it was it was meant to be the UK version of Paradise Garage, which is this legendary New York club with Larry LeVan, used to play a house club. Um, it was mixed gay, um, straight club, and it was legendary. And, you know, to this day, all house DJs refer to that as the reference point for great clubs. And Rage was meant to be the UK version. So initially, it was really for Chicago house, um, really deep Chicago house and stuff like that. So they had Colin Faber, they had Tra Trevor Fun, who were... Uh, uh, listen, man, total respect. Uh, um, Colin Faber passed away, uh, God bless his soul. Wonderful DJ. Uh, one of my real ins inspirations. Anyway, um, quite a long story short, this is quite a long story. Um, we knew a girl called Debbie who said she was connected to Rage. We didn't believe her because she was a raver and she was a bit, used to get up her nut and we thought, how the hell do you know the connections at Rage? Right. And she said, I know a guy called Kevin Millins and um, I'm going to talk to him about possibly um, getting you guys in there. So we just come out of the Acid House thing, you know, in 88, and um, we were kind of at a loose end because the criminal justice bill destroyed that scene. Yeah. And it went into clubs, and we thought, all right, you know, I was doing places, I did a place called Fun City that was great, and with Paul Anderson and, and a few other guys, and there were a few things floating about. We, we didn't have anything regular. We didn't have a residency, and, and, and that was really important to get something solid. And... Um, so this was a chance. So anyway, we went and met Kevin and he said, look, we got upstairs that we kind of just pipe music through. It's a nothing room. It's called a star bar. It's called a star that was, bar. That was in heaven, right? Yeah, this is in yeah, heaven. Upstairs heaven. in heaven. It's yeah. The smaller room, upstairs. right? The small room, yeah. Right. Upstairs. Not, not, because there's another room called Sound Chart. Okay. Which is, it's, 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 as you come in the club, you take the right, you go upstairs, there's a room there. Anyway, it was a vacant room, and he said, look, there's nothing going on in there. What about you guys coming in and doing a thing? He knew we had a following. We had a real underground following from the Acid House days, and um, we were just like, we bit his arm off, man. We ran in there, man. And, and, and um, it was a room with about 200 people, and we went in there. First week, we had about 60 of our hardcore fans that we knew would follow us everywhere. Then we had 120. By the fourth week, there was 300 people on the stairs waiting to get into their room. Right. The room was heaving, bro. It was heaving. And we were playing kind of like... It's hard to explain. It was a mismatch of house, very early techno, um, and a hybrid of breakbeats, 
when, when I talk about breakbeats, there was a lot of breakbeats coming out of New York because what was happening on the B side of tracks, little Louis Vega and those guys used to put just drum breaks and we used to speed them up. Yeah. And mix them with techno. And, and we didn't know what we do. We was clanging all over the place and everything. But we didn't care. We just liked the sound of it. Do you know what I mean? It was kind of like, you know what? It creates a, a certain vision. It's got it's got it's got its own kind of vibe, which is different. But there weren't a lot of tracks. There weren't any tracks around at the time that was incorporating that jungle techno kind of sound that we were trying to forge through blending teams together. Um, and just pitching things up beyond the way they're We were just pitching bit. things up, yeah, mixing yeah. it, banging all over the place, but we, would, we, we had a little vibe. It was like a punk rock kind of vibe. No one gave a fuck. We were just yeah. kind of like doing our thing, you know what I'm saying? So that was, and we just realised, you know, apart from the four to the floor, people... People gravitated toward breaks from breakbeat days, from, from hip hop. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, the breaks is a very urban sound. It's a very urban thing. It's a very black sounding thing. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and we just noticed every time we was mixing up the, the wire, people were really kind of feeling it. So anyway, it was cracking on upstairs and, and we were kind of like smashing it. It got to the stage where people come into rage to go upstairs. Yeah. Anyway, Trevor and Colin, um, the residents downstairs, unfortunately, took a trip to LA one week. And um, Kenny was like, how, how about you guys um, go downstairs and give it a go? And we was like, hell yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, we, 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 we grasped it with open hands. And we was a bit nervous because this was a purist house club. You've got to remember, it's, you, it's, imagine going into... A house club now, like one of the biggest house clubs, and going in there and just thinking, "Fuck it, I want to play some jungle." Yeah, it was a risk. It was a risk for him. It was a risk for us. And it fell on its face. It wouldn't have worked, and we would have probably gone back upstairs, and you know, we would have, you know, faded into obscurity. But what happens? We tore it up, bro. We yeah. smashed. It. You know, and I, I don't ever say things like that, but we absolutely demolished the place. Yeah. And even before the end of the night, five minutes before the end, he went, you got the gig. Wicked. He said, it's yours. And you know what, to be fair, we didn't want to hijack the spot like that because one, we had a good thing going on upstairs. Um, and secondly, Colin and Trevor were, we had so much respect for them. Well, they were allies, right, as well. So you don't want to tread on their toes in that. That's what I'm saying. And yeah, the, yeah. It was not, not only allies, um, no, it was guys we looked up to. You've got to remember right. that. Yeah, There's yeah. a difference. Once you've got that mad respect for someone, you know, to step in their shoes, and it was big shoes to fill. And me and Groove spoke about it for literally 20 seconds. We was like, yeah, we're going to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, first we was like, it, yeah. boy, I don't know, you know, there was like, no. Nah. You, you, you know, you don't get those chances, you know, all, all the time in your, in your career. You yeah. get those chances and you take them. And... Um, we was like, yeah, look, Kevin, look, we'll do it. And then the rest is history, bro. We, yeah. we, we just went there every week, forged the same sound we were doing upstairs. Yeah. We was blending the break beats. And then tunes started to come, we are e. That was I was going to say, what was the first tune you got given that was actually the first, that you remember going, shit, this is what we've been playing. Someone's made a tune to what we want. What was the first tune you got that was like, Do you know what? Moment? The first tune, you know, the people might argue and... You might get someone else go... No, no, this is you specifically, bro. What was the one that you... It was We Are E for me. Right, right, right. right. It was We Are E. Right. And if you listen to We Are E, it's got a four to the floor. It's got that four to the floor, and then it's Let Me Hear You Scream, then it's that breakbeat, man. And that tune used to... We used to play house. Let's get it straight. It wasn't... We weren't just going in there all night and, and, and making this hybrid of, of techno and, 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 and breaks. We were playing house as well. Yeah. So we were playing a mixture of everything. And then when we used to drop We Are E, bro, like, it was Endgame. It was Endgame. And, you know, we knew it. Yeah. We knew something's happening here because the crowd used to go mad and a different kind of energy. It was a different kind of energy. The house, everyone used to dance around and bop around. When we used to play shit like We Are E, yeah. it used to just, when that break comes in, Dude, it no used that Amen. That Amen just took it to another level. And, and and we saw a different vibe, and we were like, we're going in this direction. It's the exact same story that reminds me of the story of hip hop in New York block parties. Because when you get to that one break bit, and then DJs start mixing from break to break in like a James Brown tune, and suddenly you've got danceable break beat. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. Everyone going. That's, yeah, that's, it, you know, exactly cool, 
I remember hearing about watching a, a Cool Hurt, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, Cool Hurt, who was Jamaican as well. Um, he, oh, well, Jamaican parentage, um, he did a very similar thing. He was experimenting and tried a little thing, and um, which all comes from Jamaican sound systems and Scar and, you know, the early 60s sound systems and then brought up to modern day with, you know, sound systems that I used to listen to, like Coxon and Shaka and sounds like that. They, that. That was everything to me when I was growing up, going, then, going out and listening to sound systems, man. And then so from, from Rage, how did it then get to... So then out of Rage, Jungle was born. It became a thing. Records came, DJs came, more bookings came. And I remember looking back at lineups where you'd have you guys and all the, the sort of big techno boys as well, like yeah. on, on the same lineups and all the sort of acid house people on the same lineups too. Um, and in Birmingham, where I grew up, it was fascinating seeing these big, big sort of techno raves at the Q Club and Jungle being a tiny room with like you or Doc Scott or someone playing to a room yeah. like 50 people. Yeah, 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 I remember then, that. And then suddenly it became this thing. So it was, it's just mad seeing that progression go from small room to big room. But then obviously drum and bass happened. And then, you know, you formed Speed, which was its own thing. And we spoke about this yesterday because I was asking you about that whole legendary sort of council of drum and bass elders that kept the scene. Mm -hmm. Lockdown, you know what I mean? How did that evolve yeah. actually? That because that's that's like legendary stories you hear about this, this sort of you know, as an elite group of DJs that kept drum and bass pure, as it were, you know. Yeah, well, you know, it, it came at a time I, I remember me and Bookham played at a place called Paradise Club, um, which was in Islington that went, went on to become AWOL. And before AWOL, was that um, in Islington, a complex? Where was that? Yeah, yeah, that's it, the complex okay. in, in Islington, which is now Didn't the business science center. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Right, right. And um, we played, and it was a real jungle night. I, I think Ron, Gachet, all the jungle elite played. And, and me and, me and Bookham played four till six. I always remember this. And um, we cleared the floor, man. Cleared the floor. And the, this starts with Pat, no, like, you know what I'm saying? Heaving, people going crazy. We came on. It was like a fire happens, you know what I'm saying? I still have difficulty imagining you and Bookham DJing and clearing a dance floor. That's kind of, it, it doesn't Yeah, but you've got to remember, you know, uh, what was happening was, what we were doing was so new. Mm. And it was su such a um, departure mm. from the high energy of Jungle. You've got to remember how much energy Jungle has. Yeah. And the power it has, you know, a lot of the tracks got aim and breaks and, and really kind of pitched up. And and then when we came on and we, we played a, a, a lot more of a floaty, funky kind of sound, it was alien to people. They were kind of like, well, it's, it's like you're playing different music. It's like they're coming in and playing Marvin Gaye. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or Steve Bieber. That's not what get, they want. How did you get these tunes? Well, they were just tunes, these tunes being made. I mean, right. you know what? It was homework and, and going out and just like with Jungle, you know, once you start supporting things, and me and Danny had been playing a kind of funkier, jazzier style. And when you do that, you get people making the tunes. So, right. you know, people were making tunes in that early PFM and, and guys like that. And they, they were gravitating to what we were playing. So there weren't hundreds of tunes, but there were tunes about, do you know what I mean? And tunes that never sold, you know, when you went, walked into the record shop, you know, you had piles and piles of all these kind of early liquid and good looking kind of tunes. But we, that that's what we kind of were into. To me, the whole ragged thing just got a bit too much for me. It, it, yeah. it was great. Um, it started to get a bit stale. It started to get very generic. Um, it started, to, everyone was just, just making by numbers jungle for me. And I was looking for something else. I just yeah. thought, you know what, this is all a bit, getting a bit stale for me. Every, every track now has got the same samples. And so, you know, I'm a funk boy. I'm a jazz funk boy. So hearing man sampling Lonnie Liston Smith, Roy Ayers, Donald Byrd, that was like a dream come true. Yeah. So anyway, in the early days, you know, we were playing, we, we started to play, I started to gravitate to the sound a lot more and and we were just kind of like fuck it we're going to go out there and start playing it. you know it's a brave decision to do it because mm. we knew people weren't really ready for it and um so we started to play the style in paradise well i'd normally mix it up and play a little bit of jungle and then try and prop towards the end of the set play 
you know, the funky jazz and stuff. I didn't, this this night, I'm just all, I'm just going to play. I, there's too much of this shit around. It's too good. I'm going to play it. And we cleared the floor. And I remember afterwards, um, Danny was like, wow, you know what? We need to do a club. We need to do a club. We need to get a club together and, 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 and get get a night where we can play this music. And so Sarah Sandy was my agent at the time. And, and we spoke to her. She said, yeah, it's true. We, we should... Get, Big get, up Sarah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, get a night and, 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 and we should really club together and, and, and do something. You know what I mean? And yeah. then we met a guy called Leo from Mercury Records. And he was loved what we did. Loved the sound. Was a real obsessive. Um, and he had connects in the West End. So we were kind of like, right. all right, look. You know, he could get the milk bar. And we all met up and we, we all agreed on a Monday night we would go ahead and, 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 and do this. And, and um, we've done it. We were really excited about doing it. We've we, we done it and there was like six people in there. Like, man, weren't ready for this thing. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, we, and I remember, and I can't remember who it was, a, 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 um, a producer coming up at the end of the night and saying, this is never going to work. And I was like, why? And he was like, well, there's two things. It's the West End. And the music you play, I just don't think it's going to work. Which spurs you on even more. Do you know what I mean? It spurs you on even more. When I remember, say that. I, I, yeah, I remember having this exact conversation with you about the West End, because I was East London in my head, and I was like, and you were like, no, nah, I want to do it at the West End, and I didn't get it, because we were discussing, I think it was moving, um, sorry, it was moving, uh, moving Swerve, Swerve, ages oh, ago. But anyway, sorry, I'm jumping ahead, right. sorry about that. Yeah, 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 you uh, free me a little bit. Sorry. So back. To the, yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. You're still speaking aloud, then, bro. I really was. It was like, it was the same triggering that happened yesterday. We we're like, oh, bro, and then it just went off. I know. It's kind of like you know you're saying that aloud, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, sorry, sorry. Um, no, it's cool. Um, yeah. So then, and so then we moved it. We, we were kind of like, look, the music's too good, and and there's definitely something here. You know when something, you know when something doesn't quite work, and then but you still feel. Even there's though there's no one here, there's there's something. There's something. There's something there's, there's a seed that's been planted. And um reminds me of like the, the forward Sorry, nights. Me. It reminds me of the forward nights for the dubstep world in Shoreditch, because they were like dead for weeks and weeks and weeks and suddenly Absolutely. Bam. The best nights start like that. Listen, you know what, even to this day, the best way to get a, something popping is word of mouth. It's still to this day the best way of of of, of getting Especially if it's something that you're trying to create something from a seed and you're trying to make that grow into something bigger. Word of mouth is still the way to go. Do you know what I'm saying? Anyway, we moved it to Thursday because we thought, you know what? Um, let's try this, man. There's something here. Anyway, same thing happened. Thursday, it was very quiet for two, three weeks. And very similar to Rage, I think what happened, word got out that something different was going on, uh, something new. Um, and with, after about the fifth week, there was hundreds of people outside waiting to get in there. I remember one night getting there outside and I thought, because it was opposite Astoria. And Astoria used to do lots of gigs as well on a Thursday night. And I, I, I saw this queue and I thought, well, what's going on at Astoria tonight? And then I looked and I thought, Astoria's closed. And I looked at the queue for, for speed. Wicked. And I was just like, oh my God. And 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 from then, never looked back. It for two years, it was the best night in London, without a shadow of a doubt. It was the best night in London, man. Um, because it was new, it was fresh, and we were taking music that I grew up listening to, and these young lads were having their futuristic take on it, man. And it was so exciting to have Wax Doctor, Alex Reese, you know, or PFM, um, even Votech, all of those guys, um, Pesce, making this wonderful, beautiful music. You know, still having the punk style of, of, of jungle, where things were still out of key. You know, not everything was in key. Not everything was, you know, note perfect. No one gave a shit, man. It was just, it, there was this crate in this beautiful noise. And they were all kids. They were all kids that, you know, they didn't re remember rear group like I did. 
um, you know, I was a proper jazz soul boy, and they were just little kids that were finding samples and, and just putting them out there and making a beautiful noise with it, man. And it was, it was amazing. And every single week, you know, it was gaining momentum so much that you started to get celebrities in there. Um, yeah, I remember walking in and thinking, is that Bjork over there? Oh my God, it's Bjork. Do you know what I'm saying? And looking over to the bar, there was Arthur Baker there. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and top producers and all the A&R guys, you could tell by because they were wearing ponytails. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they had, you, know, you know what I mean? They had ponytails and you just you just saw beer ponytails at the bar. It's like the 90s, um, ponytails and an itchy nose, basically. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> You said that, not me. Yeah. But yeah, ponytails, <laughs> itchy nose. Do you know what I'm saying? And yeah. um, that, you know, and, and then you look you look over in one corner, you see Goldie um, hanging out with Waps Doctor, Groove Rider. And then in the other corner, you had Peche and Source Direct. And because they were getting their tunes played. So they were so excited. This tiny little spot was the only place where so you could hear this music. Was that parallel to what was happening at the Blue Note, or was that before? No, this was before the Blue Note. Yeah. So this was just before stuff. the Blue Note, and before yeah. Heads. Yeah. Um, and then the Heads came along and took our shine after a while. And the Heads is the same thing. Took a while to get going. But when once Heads went, got going, it blew up just in the same way Speed did. Do you know what I'm saying? But it was great. It was a great time because when you had this future take on funk, what we were doing at speed, you had this anarchic, apocalyptic look into the future, with, which was metalheads, which was weird, completely different. And, and the weirdness, the weird levels were just awesome. Hearing the weirdness yeah. coming out of heads was wicked. It, it was madness because I remember coming out. Yeah, yeah because you come out of of, of of speed and you'd be like kind of buzzing and, and, and feeling kind of like, wow. Do you know what I'm saying? Really cool, really relaxed. Like you, you like to come out of a, a, a beautiful spa. When you came out of Heads, it was like watching, like the first time you came out of the cinema watching Terminator. <laughs> you know that feeling when you come out of the cinema, your senses have been so assorted that you don't even know where you are. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You walk out and be like, what time is it? Because it finished at 12 and it used to feel like it was like six in the morning. Post-apocalyptic, 6 a.m. Yeah, no, for <laughs> real. And it, did you know Shoreditch? Around that time, it was like that because it was... It was cracking. It was, it was so industrial. It was just industrial. It was like a landscape. So it was a perfect venue for it. You come out of there and it was just like... Wow. I, I've just looked at a grim version of the future. Do you know what I'm saying? So could you tell the story you told me yesterday about a certain tune and where was that in this timeline? Oh, Pulp Fiction? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, right. No, because, right, so, got to go back to the story about Speed. So when Speed started, it blew. It blew up. It was getting the press from Mix Mag and DJ Mag, mag magazines that had not really taken that much notice of Jungle. Um, mm. A few interviews, done a few pieces, but never gave it the love. They were all over this music. They were all over it, man. They were all over it. They were. Uh oh, Frabs is frozen. Hey, big up Zinc, big up Reju, big up Decode, big up Deeps. Thank you all for coming on. Um, I hope we get Fabio back on this connection. Just as we get interesting. Well, not that he wasn't interesting before. Might have to restart this. Fabs, if you can hear me, I'm going to try and record. Sorry about that, guys. Right. I'm going to try and get Fabio back on. There we go. Man, that story he's about to tell is awesome. I'll try and find him. Yeah, it is true. 50p in the meter, all right. Well, let's do some shots before he comes on. Big up Sarah, Groove Connection. Izzy, hi. Yeah, Deeps, Reggie, done all the shouts. Lizzie, nice one. Two bad boys, yes. Right, let me try and find Fabs again. Where are you, bruv? Do you know what? I might have to actually call him. Gotta love modern technology, eh?
Come on, Fabio. Oh, man. So I might actually have to stop this, call him and restart. Sorry, guys. Third time's a charm, eh? Let's see. Love a bit of connectivity issues. Welcome back. Right, let's request Fabio again. And... Love it, love it, love it, love it. Everyone's on the technical, technical issues. Technical-ish. Easy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm back. I, was, I made a really, really, really shit pun there. It's like, you know, tech-ish. It's like tech-ish. Tech issues. Rubbish. <laughs> anyway. You <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's crack on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just shut the fuck up. Please, tell, please continue that story and stop my shit jokes. All right. So what were, what were we talking about? We were talking about... Um... We were talking the uh, Pulp Fiction, that story you told me the other day. Oh, right, yeah. So what happened around the time of Speed, what was happening was, because Mixmag and these guys were embracing what was going on with the intelligent drum and bass, they tagged the intelligent drum and bass, which was... A, 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 a re we didn't have anything to do with that. Um, we, didn't, we didn't have a name for what we were doing. And they start and also that that it's a bit it's a bit fucking derogatory because it means everything else isn't intelligent as well. Do you know what I mean? Well, there you go. That's that's what yeah. I'm saying. So yeah, it was a tag that caught on the media, the DJ magazine. Everyone started to use it. And then one day, I can't remember. I don't know if it was DJ Ron or someone like that said to me, "You know, the Jungle guys are, are really pissed off." I was like, "What do you mean?" Yeah. They're like, well, you know what? They're, they're pissed off about this name, Intelligent Drum and Bass, and, and, you know, the fact you lot have gone into the West End and doing this bougie kind of night. And was kind of like, well, no, that it, wasn't, it was never about that. For, for, for a start, we didn't, we didn't even have a name for what we were doing. And, and, and secondly, we went into the West End because I, we just thought it suited the music. Everyone had been doing this, this shit in, 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 in youth centres and stuff like that. And we just thought... Look, you know what? We're just going to bring it to the West End. We're going to try a little thing. And I was kind of like, you know what? I'm really disappointed that man ain't really supporting this thing because, you know, we're not on no bougie thing. You know, I'm a bunk boy and I used to go West End clubs and we just thought it'd be good to have some a night in there. Anyway, anyway, there was a night called Voodoo Magic. So there was a little bit of animosity. There was a little bit of bad feeling. And you've got to remember, weren't the days where you had mobile phones or social media where you could squash feet? So it was like an ongoing thing, you know, Fabio and Book them out there, who they think they are. They think they're in some elitist kind of group, you know, intelligent drum and bass. And, and apparently certain men had meeting, they had a meeting about it as well. You know, like what to do about this, which I thought was ridiculous, but hey. Anyway, um, there was a night called Voodoo Magic, which what was one of the premier jungle nights. Everyone played there. I could see DJ Zinc. Zinc will remember this night. I think he played at this night. Anyway, I walked in. It was, it was a little bit frosty. It was cool. It was a little bit frosty. You know, I saw the man's there. Mickey was there. Um, hype. Hype was on before me. Absolutely demolished the place, right? Um, everybody was there. All the elite, Ron, all the MCs, Fibo, Moose, everybody was there. Anyway, I come on and I thought, you know what? I'm sticking to my guns tonight. I don't give a shit. I'm going to play my thing. I'm going to play my jazzy style and I'm going to see what's going to happen. I absolutely smashed it. Let's get it straight. I, 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 I even someone found a tape of Hype Set and it was just amazing. Played all brand new shit, absolutely demolished the place. And it was at, uh, what club was it again? The Empire Leicester Square? Can you remember the Empire? Was it the Empire? Yeah, the one in the corner. Equinox. 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 A big that, that big commercial club on the corner, right? Yes. Come out the yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That place. It just got turned into jungle heaven. Do you know what I'm saying? Really? I can't it imagine was... that. Yeah, man. Trust me. Trust me. Yeah. And okay. Voodoo Magic was a massive night. Two bad mice on saying Equinox. It was Equinox. Yeah. It was Equinox. Big up, big up yeah. two bad mice in the chat. We can... Anyway, so... I thought, shit, how am I going to follow hype and play this kind of jazz, stroke drum and bass? It, it had different energy, had different dynamics. Anyway, come on, I can't remember what track I played, but I've killed the vibe. 
as in, as, as, in, as in killed the vibe. Everything just negative. went quiet. I could hear people. You know, <laughs> the worst thing you can do in a packed club is when you can hear people talking. I could hear people talking. I was like, shit. Dude, why didn't they just get you on to clear the nightclubs at the end of the night? It sounds like all your big stories. I don't know. It made me just <laughs> think, like, they thought, right, you know what? We, we don't need a crowd at the end of the night. Get Fabio on. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> anyway, the club is still packed. No one went. Anyway, I was, I was, I was playing my thing. I was doing my thing. I was playing PFM, Aquarius, um, all of those kind of tunes, Votech, Peche. Wasn't happening. I was dying on my ass, right? That day, um, Alex Reese was sent, sent me some stuff, Build the Sunshine and, and tunes like that. And he was on a roll. When producers are on a roll, it's unstoppable. And he was on a roll. He was on a real roll. And he sent me this thing, untitled, didn't have a name. All I remember at the beginning, it had a really long intro with a, uh, tsh, a little symbol. It was part of fiction. Didn't have a name, though. And I was dying so badly, I thought... But I'd never really heard a tune like Pulp Fiction before. It was completely different. It wasn't your typical jungle tune. You know what I mean? It didn't even have the hype, that hype sound. But there's, there's no real break in it, either. It's just like... No, there's that. It's, really, it's really thin. It's quite thin. Yeah. It's quite, but it's not that. It's not that what catches people. It's that it was... You get those tracks that are made from next to nothing that just got that energy, creates a whole life of its own, Pulp Fiction. And to this day, it still doesn't sound like no other jungle tune. There's no other jungle tune that sounds like Pulp Fiction. That's why you can play it in a set and it still kicks off. Anyway, I thought, I'm going to play this tune, you know, I'm going to play it. I'm just going to see what happens. I remember looking behind me, GQ, Mickey was standing there. Um, Flux, MC Flux was there. So I put it on. I stopped the tune as well. I haven't mixed it. So I've this is after it. this is after all the beef, all the fuckery, and all the bands are there right behind you, and you're you're you've deaded out the club basically. Yeah, and I could tell. I could. You know what? Yeah, I could hear little sniggers behind me. Like what? You know what I mean? See, intelligent drum and bass. This is what my man's trying to bring in our thing. And I was like, wow. All right, I'm just gonna g give it a go. This is a risk though, because if this goes wrong, it's end game for me. I might as well just walk out the club. Anyway, put it on, stop the tune that was playing, which was people starting to leave now. So I thought, I'm either going to get thrown off the deck or I I'm just going to die the worst death of DJs ever died on the decks ever in, in DJ history. And I've put the tune on and it's got this silent intro. So everyone's like, what the fuck is he doing? What is this? What is this? The man is dying and he's putting on some tune with some dead intro. Do you know what I'm saying? And then the beeline comes in. And I look around, all the silence, is, it's gone silent now, completely silent. So I'm thinking, which way is this going? Halfway through the tune, Mickey Finn runs up to the tune, rewinds the tune. Bro, six rewinds later. You know, the great thing was, it kind of took me to the end of my set. <laughs> my <laughs> It got me mad so much that I didn't even have to play no more tunes. It was kind of like, because I can't even follow this anyway. I've got no tunes to follow this. So this is brilliant. It just got rewound for about half an hour. And before I knew it, was like, next DJ. Do you know what I'm saying? But that moment, I remember so vividly, it was a moment, man. And, and you know, I, the only other time I had like that was... Um, right at the start of my career when we were playing Acid House. And um, I did a, a, a rave called Energy. 25,000 people there. Similar thing happened to a guy called Evil Eddie Richards. A, a lovely guy. Another guy I got total respect for, mad respect. He was dying. He was playing He was playing a set, and I don't know. Eddie used to go really deep sometimes, and he was dying. And he said to me, do you want to come on? Ten minutes before the end, he was like, do you want to come on? And I was kind of like, you know, eager, early 20s, 20,000 people, 7 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I'll come on. And because people started to throw shit at him. Oh, and he was like, I'm not having this, I'm coming oh, on. Man. So the promoter was kind of like, look, you've got to go on now, you've got to go on the decks. And you know what the first tune I picked up was? And it was brand new. This i would never heard it before. Whether it had been played before, I'm not saying I was the first to play it. But yeah. I remember just buying it that day with Strings of Life. And similar thing, 
and 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 everyone was kind of like, we we want music because there was now Eddie walked off, he'd got home, he thought, fuck you lot, I'm going home, I'm not having this kind of abuse, I'm here to play music. So there was like a five minute interlude where people, you know, everyone gets gets that gang mentality and everyone starts going, we want music, you know what I mean? And yeah. um, I remember coming on, I thought, right, he said, the promoter's like, hurry up, put on a tune. And the first thing that came out of my box was Slims Alive, man. Same same thing happened. When there's th that piano intro is possibly the greatest in dance music history. And it was, I remember the sun was coming up and everyone was just staring at me like, what the fuck? And when that beat drops, it was curtains, man. And it was curtains. And I remember just having them in the palm of my, my hands afterwards. And that, that kind of made me, afterwards, a promoter were like, look, you know what, we, we want you on all the gigs. And, and that, yeah. that was another moment. You have moments in your career that you get a bit lucky and, and things work out. And, and, and I, I've had a few of them. Yeah, I mean, no shit. I mean, you've been, I mean, like, like, talk about creating a genre, then riding the wave, then creating your own subgenre, and then riding that wave. So you, you had speed, and then speed, what, I mean, did speed become swerve, or was that just the next thing? Because obviously well, Sandy's still behind speed, both, isn't it? So. Yeah, speed kind of came to an end because um, various things. The club got a little bit funny, and 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 it just came. It just came to the end of its time. And then Metalheads was on a roll. Mm. Metalheads was on such a roll at the time, and it was a, a, a lot of people were kind of like, yeah, you know, this apocalyptic take. Goldie, you know, this this superstar was running the night. Groove Rider was the resident DJ. Um, it was game over, man, and. Um, I played at uh, Metalheads as well. You know, I played there with Doc Scott, Kemi and Storm and, and all, you know, Pesha and everyone. Can I ask you, was it difficult working with Groove as a duo in that point? Because you were both doing so many different things, like, essentially. That's at, an that interesting point. point. It, yeah. it, it, it wasn't difficult because me and Groove have always got a way of making whatever work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're boys, right? And you make it work. But it must have been quite always, divergent. Always. Yeah, but it, you know what? I went in Metalheads and I mixed it up. And, you know, there was tracks like Bug in the Bass Bin by Carl Craig. Do you know what I mean? There was tunes that you could bridge. You could, there was a little bridge between Speed and Metalheads. So, you know, like you could play, say, Rings Around Saturn by Fotec. The Heads crew would be into that because it was deep and it was different. All the rain, like, I guess, as well. Like that would kind of... Yeah, the rain and, and yeah. all of those kind of tunes. You could play those tunes and then mix it with something a little bit harder with a little bit more punch, like... Um, mute by Matrix or do you know mm. what I'm saying or something like that so the bridge was there so you know we could bridge that gap quite easily mm. but then I acknowledged it was Groove's house so I was a guest do you know what I'm saying I was a yeah, guest yeah. it wasn't Pablo and Groove right now. it was Groove. Groove it's Groove's yard yeah yeah, yeah. I've come in his house for a bit of lunch do you know what I'm saying it was sure. like that it no, wasn't because of Groove by the team Groove ruled that place, man. It was it, it was his spot. He was getting all the fresh stubs from Goldie. And, you know, sometimes you just... That's the great thing with me and Groove. It's, there's never that competition. It's mm. kind of like, bro, this is your house. And I'm a guest in your house. And I'm just going to come and do my thing. And that was the great thing, man. And, and, and you know, yeah, Metalheads was great as well, man. A great, great, great night. And it was a great time. Not only a great night, it was... These were great nights. These were great times. You know, we yeah. were younger. Um, the world was an oyster, man. We just felt so kind of free to do what we wanted. We had so much power because we had created, and me and Groove were a part of the two biggest nights, Speed and Metalheads. Yeah. And that we felt so powerful. And then, you know, luckily I've, I've had, was, when one door closes, another opens. Yeah. And then after when Metalheads finished, then Radio One happened for us. Yeah. So and then, and then did you do then, Swerve? Did you do Swerve? What when Radio One happened, or when did Swerve start happening? Swerve was around the same time as Radio One started. Right. Um, okay. Uh, Swerve was just um, again. It was you know it, it was still a lot of great funky tracks were being made. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And. I still felt like it was still, you know, small room music. It was still never taken on a, a, a big level, on the higher level. It was never taken, you know, on a big stage. Um, and so we were quite happy doing smaller clubs. Yeah. And still found, you know, a, a, you know um, 
Velvet Rooms. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I remember coming to, to Velvet Rooms when I, I moved to London in 99. So I was checking out everything because I was obviously a wide-eyed kid and just a fan mm. of yours and everyone. So I was like, oh shit, I'm in London from Birmingham and I can go and see this stuff. So Velvet Rooms was a really plush venue in terms of for, for, for that sound, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and it was quite, it was quite, like you said, it was quite a departure from, uh, from that. And I think Sarah in the comments is, is saying that Swerve started once Bookham left for logical progression. So it was kind of that. Plus, there was Bar yeah. Rumba as well, I guess. Yeah, yeah, of course. Time, there was so. Bar Rumba. Bar Rumba started around the same time. Movement yeah. started around the same time. And I remember we didn't want to clash because we was on a Thursday and they right. wanted to do Thursday. So it right. was like, all right, we're going to go on a Wednesday and they did the Thursday. So, you know, you got to remember in this time as well, what was so great was you could have... These were midweek nights now. This was not weekend. This was not on Friday and Saturday. This was on Wednesday and Thursday. Yeah. And you can have two nights. And look, there was never and, any problem. It was not and that Heads was on a wrong. Sunday, innit? As well. Heads was on a Sunday and it finished yeah. at 12 o'clock and it started at like 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So that's what was so special about this time. It was midweek. I don't know, maybe there was a bit more disposable income around that time. Do you know what I mean? People had money because, you know, people still raved over the weekends. So, and, you know, but midweek raving was, was special, man, because. You felt like the Friday and Saturday night you had to stick to a certain style and people expected to hear, you know, bangers. Where midweek, you could experiment. You yeah. could kind of get away with doing shit that you couldn't over the weekend. I don't think these nights would have worked on a Friday and Saturday night. I think, I think it was via, via Tendai, Jide, Big Up, Tindai, Big Up Tendai, yeah. who was your resident that we know each other before, before I got into Radio 1, was how I passed across before that. Was from uh, from me and Jedi, so I've got a lot of um, a lot of love for Swerve, and a lot of love for that whole scene that you created. Did Creative Source start at the same time? The label was that was that in parallel? No, to Creative Swerve? Source started, in, in, you know, um, in about ninety four, ninety five. Oh, before that, okay. Yeah, Creative Source was was going before that, and um, do you know everything kind of came together because Swerve was going and Swerve was going really well, but then Caliber came along. Hmm. You know what I mean? Caliber came along and, and, and you know, this was another a moment where things went on to another level, man. You know, we, I met Caliber at a club in, 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 in Dublin called, what was it called? The night was called Quadraphonic. Big up to Teresa and Brian Spollen. Um, they did um, a, a, a night which was amazing. It was The club was owned by Bono. From you too, really? Yeah, and it, it was a, it was a part of a hotel called the Kitchen. The club was called the Kitchen, an okay. amazing little club. Again, a tiny little space, two hundred people. And Bono owned it. It was a part of a really bougie hotel, five star hotel. And um, then one of the guys there called Razor, who was running it, uh, said, uh, I, "I really want you to meet this guy. Um, he's a gardener. His name's Dominic, and." Um, he, he's making some amazing tunes. He said, I think they're amazing anyway. And he, he gave me a couple of tracks, this guy Ray, and went, tell me what you think of them. And one of them was called Cosmic Funk. And, and that was the one that grabbed me. And it wasn't great. It wasn't a great tune. It was a bit um, underproduced. Um, it, it wasn't, the mix down was really poor. But there was something, there was something there. And then um, Dominic came down. And there was two of them. There were two guys. It was, there were two guys at first. It wasn't just Dominic. It was okay. Dominic and another guy that used to make tunes. And, they were and that was it, it wasn't Dominic's role. Sorry, it's another shit joke. I didn't even get that one. Dominic Rollins. I didn't even Rollins. hear it. Okay, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. I'm glad. <laughs> anyway, ignore me, ignore me. No, carry should on. I move on? Should I carry on? Yeah, yeah, please, please. please. <laughs> You're getting pissed now, ain't you? I can see, I can see, I can tell you. What are you drinking? Uh, and a mighty fine bourbon. Wicked. No. Yeah. But sorry, please continue. I'll shut the fuck up. Yeah, so anyway, cut a long story short because it's a long story and I'm rambling. Um, so then uh, we got the hook up with him. Um, the other guy left. Uh, I think he had a full-time job, so he didn't want to do it anymore. And um, Caliber changed the game um, for me because what he done, he was the epitome of everything that I needed at that stage. Yeah. Musically. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, we just come out of the era of Wax Doctor, PFM, um, Peche, all those guys. 
Source, source Direct. Um, but Calibre came with a simplicity. And I guess um, it translated to the dance floor better. I guess it was more direct from the head to the dance floor, maybe. That's what I'm saying. It, it, it was, very, yeah, you're right. It, you know, he had a very direct style. It was very simple. It wasn't complex, so it was easy to dance to. Mm. And he had a way of making music move, but in a very, very subtle, simple way. He had, a dance, he had that dance floor energy and that head scratchy kind of train spottery kind of vibe as well. You know what I'm saying? And it, it, to be honest with you, he was very similar to Wax, Wax Doctor was very similar. Wax Doctor never gets the credit he deserves, man. Wax Doctor was on point. Also around the same time as Calibre was Marcus Intellex. You know, yeah. God bless him. Marcus was... It's crazy to say. I still think to this day he's quite underrated. Do you think, I think I there was a outpouring of love for him when he passed? Oh, that was, listen, man. That guy. That and the, guy first, was... the first Marcus tune I own is on, that I bought was on Creative Source. Oh, really? I'm oh. pretty certain. Yeah. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think... Yeah, yeah I, I, but Marcus, Marcus was incredible. And Caliber and Marcus around that time for me, they, they were setting the template, man. And Caliber, we used to get... When we was... Um, getting the album together, Music Concrete, his, his debut. Yeah. We were getting 20, 30 tunes a week that he was making like three, four tunes a day. We had to tell the man to slow down. We was, at one stage, I was like, bro, listen, you, you need to calm down. You're making too much tunes. What is going on with you? What is... What? And every tune was a banger. It was like every single tune was, 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 was amazing. And we was like, bro, we need to make an album with 17 tracks on. I've got 200. You're making this process really difficult for me. So, you know, it was, it was a wonderful time, that early, the early liquid days, man. And then uh, Marky and them guys came along. Do you know what I'm saying? We're bringing that whole Brazilian flavor. And then you had guys like DK with It's On The Way. Yeah. And AI with Desperado and tunes like that. AI made some amazing tunes. Moving On uh, and tunes like that. It was, it, it was one of those... It's great to be part of something like that, where every single week you're just getting new shit that's blowing your mind, man. So the, the one label that we haven't really talked about that in my mind connects it both is reinforced because obviously Four Hero are on that jazzy tip or at least went, went to that jazzy tip and became pronounced in that with two pages. Before that, obviously the whole relationship with Goldie and that whole, that whole thing. Did that, did that factor into what you were doing at all as well in terms of that oh, overlap? Four Hero. Reinforced were amazing. Because reinforced um, those guys, they but reinforced had a more jungle vibe. What they were doing, they were they were mixing jungle, yeah, with soul. So you it was less jazzy and more soulful, basically. Yes, it was more soulful. Right, right. So they had Tom and Jerry, um, all that kind of shit was which was amazing, and they were kind of it was this jungle, soulful jungle vibe which was really warm, but then still had the jungle energy. Yeah. Um, then Bookham was, was a complete, good looking was a different sound. It was big string intros yeah. and epic cinematic. It was like, a very cinematic life. sound. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a big, you know, big string drops, huge pads, big intros. And my style was a bit more stripped down. It was not so much strings, more roads and, and a little bit more of a stripped down funk sound, which was which went on to become liquid funk. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So and, basically, um, Calib Calibre was the embodiment of the thing playing in your head, basically. Oh, absolutely. Liquid yeah. funk was everything that I wanted, Calibre was making. And, and it, it was, if I could make music and I could make music that anybody, it would have been Calibre. Because he encompassed everything that I loved about the music. And he still does. He still does, man. Yeah. And, um, yeah, those were great times. But the great thing about drum and bass, you know, it, 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 it keeps on evolving, man. I still get my head blown off by tunes. And to this day, man, I heard something yesterday that I can't even reveal what it is because it's top secret. But I heard a track yesterday and I was just like, my God. Do you know what I'm that, saying? I still get that buzz, man. That's a, that's a good point, actually. I just, I just realised one another label obviously we're missing is Moving Shadow because there was just untold amounts of tunes on Moving Shadow that oh, crossed Moving over. Shadow. Come on, man. All you know, you know, no, you know, the, the, 
look, when it comes to labels, I mean, you could go on and on. And I, that's why I don't want to mention too many labels because you end up missing out labels. But there's yeah. IB for Records. IB for Records was, was, was an amazing label. Living yeah. Dream, which was um, a very early jungle label. They were yeah. amazing. Reinforced, Moving Shadow. Yeah. All of those guys helped the movement, man. So, I mean, the one Moving thing... Moving Shadow, that... they were so prolific. I mean, they bought out 100 tunes by 1999. They'd already bought out their 100th tune. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Moving Shadow, so, 100. Suburban Bass. Suburban Bass. Three records of it, yeah. Suburban yeah. Bass. Ram. Ram were doing their thing for a long time as well. Yeah. Zinc, bingo, bingo. But I kind of mean, I kind of mean tunes that, or, or, or certain tracks from these labels that then fed into your particular vibe. Do you know what I mean? In terms of one or two tracks and labels that were crossing that dark, jazzy divide. That yeah, well, Zinc bought at Casino Royale. Mm. Of course. Casino Royale one of the greatest liquid tunes ever made. That tune, man, when I heard Casino Royale, I was like, and I think he just, he just made... Trek. He just made a huge garage tune. One three eight all Trek. The garage boys. Trek. One three eight. One three eight Trek. That's it. Yeah. Right. He just made that. And, and, and I was thinking that we lost Zinc to <laughs> to the other side. You know what I'm saying? And then he brings that Casino Royale, and I'm just like, Jesus, man. That's got one of the longest intros in, in, in drum and bass history. I was like, when is this track going to fucking start, man? No, I mean, I, it has that, 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 when, it, when it drops, man, it's just incredible. It's you just reminded me of the first time I heard Super Sharp Sharp Shooter with like a 25-minute intro, and then it finally yeah. fucking dropped. <laughs> yeah, but he did, you know, Zinc was amazing at doing that, you know, yeah. creating, again, creating something out of very little. So I know you've got to. I know you've got to run because you said you've got a tight hour and you've got to go. But one quick, quick, quick question before you head because you said it's like seven pm. So yeah, you, you can ask me a couple more because you know we okay, did get cut off. So a couple more, man. All right, cool, bro. But um, one quick question going way back to your funk days. I know when Prince passed away a few years ago, we had a yeah. big conversation about your funk days and experiencing clubbing in the funk world in London and and all that crossing over. And one fascinating thing that came to my mind as you were talking was that no, none of those artists have ever sampled anything by Prince, as far as I know. No, no, and they I haven't. Wonder, and I wonder why that is. Maybe one, because they haven't had access to print stuff, really. I mean, print um, is everywhere, isn't it? Like, like, it's print. Well, you know, it's Spotify, you know, it's only being able to stream prints recently. You know what? Mm. That's not, that's not in it. That's, that's not right at all, actually. I don't know why. Yeah. It's a weird thing. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you one thing about prints. Prints bridge that gap between being a rock star. He could be anything he wanted to be. Sometimes he was Curtis Mayfield. Sometimes he was Marvin Gaye. Sometimes he was Mark Bolan. Sometimes he was... He could be anything, though, innit? That's and wicked. That's, why... not... that's a wicked description. Sometimes he could be Mark Bolan. That's but it's true, though. And that's why a lot of people didn't get Prince. I, yeah. You know, I think there's a person that I know who's a real music fanatic. And we were speaking the other day, and they said... I was talking about it was Prince's third. Is it the third or the fourth anniversary of his death? Fourth, I think. Fourth, oh, so, someone's just mentioned S "Shut Up and Dance" sample Prince apparently. Hooligan sixty nine sample. Oh, Prince, apparently yes, they did. In the comments. Yes, they did. Respect to that. I'm going to write that you down. Real heads listening. Yes, they did. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Cool. But sorry, you were saying, sir. Yeah, Prince was. Um, he could morph into anything. So I think because he, he had so many different styles, and unless you knew Prince, I was into Prince from before you, from the very, very start. Yeah. Um, it's hard to grasp because you hear something like Let's Go Crazy, which is straight up rock. Do you know what I'm saying? And then you hear something like Sign of the Times or A Door is... from the album, which is Curtis Mayfield. So people didn't really get the fact that this guy was... A chameleon. See, Sound of Times to me was like proto hip hop in my head because I'm just like, who who raps oh, really? basically sings and, that and trap, produces. Isn't it? Yeah, that trap, that emptiness of trap, yeah. that sparseness. And it, that, that album's genius for me, Sound of the Times. That album, man, it's up there with songs in the clear life and and those great epic masterpieces. You know what I'm saying? I was impressed that you referenced when we talked about Prince about your favorite trap being uh, Tambourine. From yeah. from, uh, the world from around the world in a day, yeah, yeah.
Bad shoe. And it's about, what, three minutes? And you didn't really know. I remember I said to you, check that track out. I was fucking blown away. You guys, wow, that track is fucking bad, bro. Yeah, so that, that's a tune, man. Do you reckon it's because the sparse, it's, not, it's difficult because he never used a break, right? It's always quite, because he programmed quite on, like, it, with hits. There's nothing you can sample without being distinct. That's what I mean. Yeah. And, he, and he had a really full sound. He didn't have breakdowns in his tunes, did he? Not really. He didn't have enough, like, Dearly Beloved, that's why Only Good 69 sampled it. But he right. doesn't have moments in his tunes where you just think, yeah, I'm going to rip that. I'm going to rip yeah. this. It's very difficult. Very difficult to rip him off. I got Decode to sort of warp um, uh, Let's Go Crazy because it runs at 190. So I could slow it down and just have that da -da 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 somewhere. Yeah. But it's really fucking difficult to place it because you said, like, you're right. It's so, it's so full that it's difficult to yeah. grab. It's hard to just take one piece out and sample. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But yeah, he was the man. That's nuts. And so one more, uh, one final question before you go. The funk club scene uh, in, in the UK that you experienced and the whole interaction of different cultures and, and everything colliding. Sorry, say Can that again. Can you speak about that? The whole funk club scene in the UK that you experienced before, almost before you started DJing, basically. Well, you know what? Uh, my first, I was into funk. I've got a, I've got a, a name check, my cousin, Elaine. Mm -hmm. um, she got me into funk because she... I was, I was really close to her, and we, she lived around the corner. She was um, about five years older than me, and, and I used to go around there, and she used to always have Bob James and Roy Ayers albums and stuff like that, and she used to tell me about nightclubs. And I was like, wow. Okay, I, sorry. You know I mean, I'm getting it so dreamy life. Someone had to tell you about nightclubs. is so funny to me. Sorry, bro. That's just a joke. But yeah. <laughs> but I was, I was 13. I was 13. Right. I was 13. So she was telling me about nightclubs, and... I had this, just had this mad, she painted these pictures for me. And one day, right, she, there was a club called Crackers in, in, in Wardour Street. And it was, it went on at one o'clock in the afternoon from one till four. She said, look, I'm going to take you down to the West End. I'm going to, I'm going to buy you the, some soul gear, which was like a little skinny tie, tartan shirt, jazz slippers, some tight up trousers, and, um, <laughs> And she bought me a whole uniform, and she said, "Look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you down to this club." Um, so just to interject, that sounds like Shoreditch hipsters today. Exactly. I was, I was waiting. Exactly. You get me? Now, though, I can wear that yeah. style now down Shoreditch, and they'd be jumping all over me. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And um, way ahead of the game, man. Way ahead of the game. And um. She, she had to tell my mother she was just taking me to the West End just for a day out. Do you know what I'm saying? And um, she said, if the security asks you any questions, just say you're 80. Because, you know, I was a tall lad. I, I looked it. Do you know what I'm saying? And uh, I remember we walked, we got there. Security looked me up and down. And he just said, yeah, cool, go in. And that moment, man, my heart was racing, walking down the stairs. And walking into this club, man, seeing a little guy, seeing Paul Anderson. Paul Anderson was playing. Paul Trouble Anderson. Paul Trouble Anderson. Yeah. And dancers, um, girls everywhere. This was like Nirvana. Loud music. I've never heard music loud before. You've got to remember that. Loud music. And people just loving the music, man. And, and, and a uniform, a way of dressing, a certain style. And that was me. And you know what? To be fair, Ever since those days, I've never, until lockdown, I've not taken a break from nightclubbing since yeah. I was 13, bruv. Because I got into the whole nightclubbing thing then, used to go to 100 Club, and then I got into sound systems. I was going out to Sir Copson, Shashaka, the whole thing. Then I became a soul boy again. Then rave happened, then drum jungle happened, then drum and bass happened. So until lockdown, trust me, man, I've not had a break. And just before lockdown, um, last year, last November, I went to the States. I did a, 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 a three-week tour of the States. Then I went from, straight from the States to, I, had, I remember I came back on Christmas Day. Uh -huh. And then the next day I flew to Thailand for New Year's Eve. And then I went to China. I went to China just when COVID was breaking out, actually. Because the funny thing was, I remember 
when I was in Shenzhen, mm -hmm. I was watching CNN and there was a tiny clip right at the end where they said in Wuhan, there's an outbreak of this virus, this mystery virus that it, it affects your, um, your lungs and, and, and two people have died of it. I was like, wow, wow, what's this? And I remember saying to the promoter, have you heard of this, this, this thing called coronavirus? And he went, no. And I said, man, check, check the news. Cause, and I said, where's Wuhan? And he was like, it's, oh, it's miles away. And then before we knew it, man, it became this thing. And by the time yeah. I got back from China, um, news had started to get out there that there's this dangerous virus, man. And then it just took on this, this life of its own. And, and, and to believe, to think that we're in June now. Yeah. And we're still, still people are dying, you know, you know, 150 people died last night. From, from from COVID, yeah. Um, so it's crazy, man. But I tell you what, it's it's made me reflect because I tell you what, I've been living in the club moment for thirty odd years now, and I've never really seen the wood for the trees. Yeah, and it's just made me look back on my career, on on, on my achievements, um, and and just have a you know, I've just got a different. It just made me think about life now and. Things I've never had. Because you've got to remember, it's kind of like Monday comes around, you're just thinking, right, I've got to get tuned for the weekend. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got to get tuned, you know, I'm going to Belgium on Saturday or, you know, I'm going to Bristol or Birmingham or... So you're, you're never you're never living in the moment. You're always living in the weekend. Mm. And you know what I'm saying? And is, is, which flights am I getting and all that kind of and shit. And then before you know it, the weekend's gone. Yeah. Or a gig that you'd... Booked, been booked six months ago. Before you know it, you're there and it's gone. And so time, you're you're in this capsule all the time. And lockdown is kind of like I've had time, bro. I've had to time to sit down and think. And and, it, and it's been, I've been a, a lot more relaxed than I thought I would be. Yeah. Well, I think it's a well deserved break, bro. I mean, quite frankly, like you know, you've if given I could have a break part. like this and get paid and get money, <laughs> that's fucking brilliant. I've never that worked. Is true. That is true. That is true. That is true. Bro, you know, like on that, and this conversation, I mean, do you, are you okay to chat still, by the way? I just want to double check. Yeah, yeah. A couple more minutes, though. Yeah, I've got a I've oh, got Because cool. yeah. you know what? There's, there's that one thing, right, that this kind of boils back to, which is what we were talking about, the 90s music industry aspect of it, when people were getting signed left, right and centre, and the labels came in. And you and I were discussing the kind of almost the gentrification of drum and bass. You know what I mean? That, that whole movement yeah. of something going underground to the mainstream. Where, and, and we also discussed that it happened with fucking rock and roll. It, ha it happens with everything. It's a natural thing that yes. goes from the underground to the mainstream and, and it becomes this thing. And we talked about the 90s. And, and for the reason why you mentioned that, uh, the reason why it came up is because you're talking about like, you know, earning and, and how things got big. But there was a fascinating story you told me about um, labels approaching artists and, and what was happening at that point. Oh yeah, I mean there, there there was a well when I was talking about speed and the and, and the and the ponytails, you know, Goldie got signed in speed. He got signed to London Records. Mm. Um, um I, I remember the night when he, he said to me, you know, I'm gonna sign with London. I think they were called FFRR at the time, weren't yeah. they? It was wasn't it, wasn't and, it um, and, Pete Tong's label and he got into it was Pete Tong's on Radio label. One. And, that's right. And um and then Source Direct got signed, Peche got signed. Um, um, everyone got Groove got signed to Sony, DJ Rap got signed to Sony, and um, I remember one. I was I was speaking to a record exec, and he was like, "Look, fucking hell, man, Speed is amazing." Blah blah blah. He was like, um, "You know, we'd love to sign you." And I went, "Well, do you know about any of my stuff?" And he went, "No, but you know, we'd love to sign you." And I said, "I don't, I don't make music." Mm -hmm. I said I had a bad experience making music once, and you know, and I, you know, I, I don't make music, so thinking the guy was going to walk away, yeah. And he was like, "Well, you know, we can get you an engineer. You don't have to do fuck all, like money for nothing." And I was kind of like, "Well, no, I don't, I, I don't make music. Do you know what I'm saying? You're yeah. better off signing someone who, who, who can do a job for you, man. Do you know what I'm saying? And with me, it's a risk. And, and did you want to, though? Huh? Did you, did you ever want to make music? That was the point. Like, you know, you we had a really bad experience really early on in our, in, in our career. We, we made a track called Rage, 
where we sampled 808 State, a track called um, uh, 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 Oh, I can't remember what it's called. Is that on your album? The Rage album? No, it's not. Because it got, we, we, we basically, we got, you got to remember making a tune back in the day weren't easy. We met yeah. a guy called uh, Uni who bankrolled everything. You remember back in the day, if you wanted to make a, um, a tune, you'd have to go to a studio. If you didn't have a studio, you'd have to pay mm. by the hour to stay in a studio. And I remember this guy had money, he was really into being groove, and he was like, look, I'm going to bankroll this whole project. Was it and, Cubic? Yeah, Cubic. That's it. Right? So yeah. we made this tune, and it was a fucking disaster. The guys that, we, that engineered the tune turned around and said, oh, all we did was smoke weed, which is partly true. And, um, <laughs> There's stories about that that I'm not going to share on this. But yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's off, 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 off mic shit. And, off he, mic, he, yeah. and, and, and basically said we did fuck all, and which was not true. I mean, you know, we, did, we didn't know. We just told them what we wanted. Right. And also 808 State then threatened to sue us and stop the track. And then the, the guy that <laughs> the guy that bankrolled it pressed thirty thousand copies and fucked off to South Africa and didn't pay us. So we, we had a nightmare, and I didn't really come from that. And I was kind of like, "No, no the music's not me." Doesn't it's never felt natural. Yeah, it's just not me. It's just not me at all, man. It's it's interesting. I had a similar. I think I like when when I interviewed Tricky ages ago. We had a similar conversation where he got signed and they didn't know what they'd signed really. It was like he was a rapper with, with Massive Attack and he was just like, make an album. He's like, all right. You know, it's a very similar kind well, of... Well, they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know what they were doing with, 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 um, with any of the artists. Yeah, really. a lot of the signings. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? It's, it's, it's a pattern that's happened. And this is where you've got to give maximum credit to, to, to drum and bass. Jungle, whatever you want to call it. It survived that. And many scenes haven't. Yeah. You know, they did it to Garage. Same thing, they came in, they signed Mystique, they signed Craig David, they bastardized the music, they watered it down. Um, so Solid came along, they were these rebels, and they destroyed it. They destroyed the music, they came along and made their garage producers work with their fading pop, pop artists, and just destroyed the whole scene. You know, it happened with dubstep as well, you know. All of a sudden, Skrillex came along and Taylor Swift was making dubstep and it just kind of finished it off. And then it happened, but drum and bass, where it's, it's such a movement where people are like, are very anti-elitist. They, they really don't like the elite. We were very wary of the elite at the time. But you know what? I've got, I've, I've and, and, and forgive me for saying this, but I've got some dodgy d &B remixes of many, 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 many mainstream singles from back then. Like yeah. many. Like I think I've got, I think I've got, an Aphrodite remix of Holly Valance, which I find fucking brilliant. <laughs> right? I, I, you know, I've got, some, I've got some remixes that I fucking Yeah, but that's like what was that. going on. And that's <laughs> what I'm saying. They wanted to make acts that were on their label that weren't cool anymore, yeah. give them a remix from Votech or Source Direct to make them cool again. And that, yeah. that was the whole thing. They didn't give a shit about any of these guys, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why, you know, when, the, the, you know, when they thought, oh, well, Jungle drum and bass is, is, is no longer a thing anymore. They dropped everyone like a sack of shit. Do you, do you, you know how I measure it? Is that if I can hear the music that I'm into on an advert, that's the crossover point. So as soon as I heard like D&B on a commercial on telly, I was like, oh fuck, it's, it's gone now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I remember, I remember, put it this way, I remember years ago, you know, I grew up watching Top of the Pops. Um, you know, uh, just being a music fan and seeing, you know, watching Top of the Pops and absolutely loving it. And I remember a guy called Chris Paul um, made a track called, was it Devotion? Oh, what did he make? He, was, he used to run Orange at the Rocket and he made a track that got in the charts called, it was called, um, I'm looking at a 10 City sample, I think. A what sample, sir? A 10 City. 10 City sample, that's the way love is, or something like that. I want to give you devotion. I'm sure it was devotion. I want to give you devotion. Like I, that big called, I, I want to well, give you devotion. Yeah, no, that was, it, it was called Isotop Topic or something like that. Oh, Isotopic. 
I'm really confused. Different strokes. No, was it different strokes? Someone just put it up here. Was it different strokes? Different yeah, strokes. Different you mean no, Nomad Devotion was the lyrics of that, like, was, was I want to give you devotion with that sample. Isotonic. 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 Put in isotonic. Okay. okay. Isotonic. Okay. Anyway, we made this tune and we were really close to him. And, um, yeah, different strokes by Isotonic. And he was going on top of the pops. And he said to me in Groove, look, are you guys going to come on here and, you know, pretend to be playing decks? He was like, fuck no. I'm not going on fucking top of the pops. He was mad. Do you regret not doing that stuff? We were just, no, because we, we turned into, uh, a real, we had a real mistrust of anything corporate. And yeah. so, and we, we just thought that anything like that wasn't cool. You know, jungle was underground and we didn't want to be on fucking top of the box. Do you know what I mean? I was happy for Chris. But we was, was it, like, no, we're not, we're not going on top of the pops. Wasn't no crust? Crust was in a, a '90s uh, uh, UK kind of soul to soul equivalent, right? That was on top of the pops. No, he was a part of um, Smith and Mighty, I think. Smith and Mighty, who had a "Just Be Good to You," maybe was it? It was a massive Bristol outfit, and they had a few big hits. Right, right, okay. And he, I think, he had a family. And so he was linked to them. Right. Um, and so he was linked to Smith and Mighty, um, who had a couple of really big hits, man. Fresh four, Deep's is saying. Fresh four. That's right. That's nice. right. Fresh four, Lizzie. One wishing... bit of technology, eh? Do you wishing know what I mean? on a star. Yes. A yes, that's video. it. Crust in the that's video. It. Yeah. yeah. Crust was in that. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And so we've not touched on loads of things. Ronnie, Crust, all of those guys, the Bristol sounds. V, that was amazing, and, and you know, but you know, I tell you what, um, we could have gone down the house road, and it's really funny. Um, mm. I've got to tell you this story quickly, and then I've got to go. Okay, I haven't seen Carl Cox for years, and I saw him in Miami about seven, eight years ago. And he had a marquee, he had his own marquee, he had lobster, he was serving fucking lobster in his marquee, <laughs> champagne. <laughs> 200 bottle uh, pound bottle of champagne he had in this in this in this little marquee and he had a little trailer he had a fucking trailer outside right okay so we walked in and we were sitting down talking to him and carl's the nicest fucking guy you'll ever meet he's such a lovely soul very very mellow very lovely lovely guy and his manager came up to me and she was like wow don't you think this is all amazing you know carl you know he's doing this you know he's got eric murillo playing for him he's serving up fucking lobster you know we all, we're all sitting back here drinking champagne and she looked at me and she she laughed and she said it and it and she didn't you know when someone says something but they mean it and she went where did where did it all go wrong eh and she looked at me and was like what the fuck like what do you mean where did it all go wrong yeah you know, the, the truth is I chose my path, yeah. right? And every day I get up, I feel blessed, bro. I still yeah, feel yeah. blessed. A little guy from Brixton who flunked his way. You know, I was a, a very bright guy, fucked up at school, fucked up at college, was unemployed. Music saved my fucking ass, bro. And I created a genre. I helped invent a genre. And, and you know, no one will ever take that away from me. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? And we had a chance. There was a chance. There was a time where Matthew B and Carl Cox went over to house where we could have went over to house. And let me tell you something, though. If we went over to house, we would have fucking smashed it. Same way. Same way. We would have been massive house DJs. And if I was to go back there and they would say, at the end of this tunnel, there's a fucking pot of gold, or you stay in the struggle with drum and bass, I would stay in the struggle. Yeah. If I had to make that choice again. And I so that's... I had to start her down. And I told her that. And I was kind of like, look, yo, I, I'm what Carl's done is fucking amazing. But me, I, you know, I don't, I don't need a lot out of life. Do you know what I mean? My happiness comes from just, just seeing my kids do well, my family do well, and simple things. You know, yeah. little things, not money or, or, or having lobster in a fucking marquee. You know what I mean? My, 
little things like having an artist and you know and seeing someone like Caliber come through and and watching Groove Groove Rider take Pendulum from a little rock band in New Zealand to headlining Radio One fucking weekenders. Do you know what I'm saying? That's those that legacy. That's what I'm all about. Do you know what I'm saying? Because and, and you know what? You've just answered the very first question I started with on that whole chat, which is, how are you not a dickhead? How are you, being this inventor of genre, just so fucking lovely and supportive and so... You're, like, you're just one of the nicest people, the most supportive people I've ever met, and I want to thank you for that. Thank right? you. I, you. And, and you've explained it all just there. So thank you. You know so what? It comes... You know what? It comes... It, look, it comes from my dear mum, and I've, got, I've just got to say this, and I've really got to go now. It comes from my dear mother, and my mum... Um, instill me. She always used to say to me, everybody shit stinks. And I never knew, used to know what she was talking about when I was younger. And she was basically saying, everyone's the same. You know, yeah. don't treat anyone no different. You know, money is not a reason because we all bleed. We all bleed. And everyone shit stinks. And, and I, and that is, the, that's true. And that, that's followed me. And my mum used to listen to my radio shows because mm. I, I fucked up at school, fucked up at college. My old man weren't happy because you know dads are never happy. Like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, what have you done with like a DJ? Isn't that just some guy wearing dark glasses who's about seventy carrying around a road show like, with lights and a and like speaking? Get, get a know, job vibes. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, why do you? That's not an aspiration. And my mum always used to be like, look, you know what? You've always loved music. You know, just body apart. You know what I'm saying? And my mum used to listen to my radio shows. Um, when we were, you know, they used to move us around a lot at Radio 1. We, they moved us two to, three to five on a Friday night. And I used to go and see my mum, God bless her soul, and she used to say, I listened to your show last night. Oh, that's and, mad. And, and I was like, what? And what time did you get up and made dad dinner and, you know, and, and done the gardening? And, and, and she was like, yes, yes. And she used to like, a, she, you know what, what tune she really liked? For some bizarre reason... She loved Love Speed from Chase and Status. Oh, wow. Their first, their first big tune. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah da, da, da. I think it used a Willie Hutch sample, that tune. And she loved that tune. And she said to me, um, oh, my God, yes, that tune. I like one tune. And I think she said it was by George and Status. And I was like, Chase and Status. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yes, yes, yes. Chase and Status. And I was like, yeah. She said, I really like that tune. And, and, you know, so Love Stream is a really special tune for me because it was the only tune that my mum ever said she really liked. That's but she amazing, was so bro. proud of me doing my shit, man. So, you know, it's the little things, man. It's the little things that make you happy. You know, the money, you know, I haven't made a penny since fucking lockdown. You've got to remember, man ain't DJed. Funny enough, I played at a festival called Bang, Bang Face. I played at a festival in March. I, know, I can't imagine you doing bang face, bro. Bang face is weirdos like me. What the fuck are you doing there? It's mad thing. It's a mad bro. I went in there. It was like really it's cool. Like, like, just, just, what to carry, going on just, here? just to explain to people what bang face is. It's basically bang face is kind of like a a a Apex twin dressed as Bassett all sorts men. It's weird. <laughs> that's the only thing. That's not only. It's it's. Full of a lot of white dreads, um, and people wear girls that wear um, uh, 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 have dummies in their mouths and got green hair, and and, and we got on stage and there was a a punk band that were playing trap, uh, and they were rapping and it, over kind of punk rock. It was just the most mad thing I'd ever seen in my life. I'm quite shocked to hear that you played that role. That's quite really. Yeah, man, because I know artists like End User or Square Push. Oh, it's really people. left field. It's really yeah. left field. Yeah, that's what I mean. So I can't it's imagine playing there. That's oh, yeah, no, when we, when we came on after this random kind of punk band. Yeah. And um, they loved it. They loved it. They loved it, man. You know, we went in hard. You got, you know, they didn't want to hear Lonnie Liston Smith put it that way. Yeah. Um, so we went in quite hard, but it was brilliant. It was brilliant. And the funny enough, the last gig I did, I, 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 I remember was. At the old blue note, what? I, at the old blue note, it's called something else now. It's called. You mean you, you mean isn't it a Mexican restaurant now? In in, yes, in Hoxton Square, it's, it's got behind it. It's got it's got a it's got a, a room. It's got no. a, yeah. 
I it's just got, like it's, it's got to hold now. about three, four hundred people. What? At the same time? Yeah, man. Yeah. It's got a room, brother. It's been there for years. I played there about three, four years ago. Yeah, and that was the last thing I, I did. I, I mean, obviously, you know what you're talking about. I'm, I apologise for asking this again, but are you sure? Because you walk in, it's a restaurant, and the basement where... Well, you know, you, you, walk in, you walk in and there's a restaurant, and then you walk upstairs, and there's... Trust me, there's a dance floor up there. I'm not shitting you, bro. It's not exactly where Blue Note is. It's right next to it. Oh, Huxton Bar Kitchen. Kitchen. Yeah. Or are you on about Siegfried at the end? No. Okay. The Hoxton Bar and Kitchen has got a, it's got a room upstairs that they 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 have parties in, bro. Okay. Okay. And about two. That was the last gig I did, so I remember that clearly. Oh yeah. It was okay. The fourteenth or something like that, and I, I done the gig. And I remember coming back in an Uber pool, and this I was in an Uber pool. With this really young girl, she was about twenty, and she was going, "Oh, all this COVID shit is bullshit, isn't it? Corona's bullshit." You know, it just affects old people. I thought, well, you're talking about me there, darling. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, then we were kind of still, you know, yeah, well, this is going to last a couple of weeks. Yeah. It's crazy that we're still here now, man, in lockdown, having to speak on... On this remote thing. Time, you know what I mean? But people have been inventive on, on lockdown, which is great. You know, there's been... I think there's a new way being forged in a, in a lot of ways. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think... Celebrity culture's being torn down slightly. There's wars being torn down right now. And, totally. And a lot of it is because people are in lockdown, frustrated, going fucking mad, and they're just angry. And, you know, wars are being torn down, bro, so... Totally. Well, I mean, what, the way that I've kept saying is by doing this every Wednesday. So, and thanks for fucking agreeing to get... What, what do you know what? Drink. I'm going to come back and do it again, man, because we've not even touched the surface. Wicked. We've not even touched the surface. I'm not actually joking. We could talk for another three hours. So, I'll come back and do it again. Wicked, bro. Maybe I appreciate it. Maybe cleared up a little bit and, you know, uh, you know, anytime you want me back, man, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue, because if I didn't have something to do now, if I didn't have to go and see my daughter, I would... Carry on talking to you. I've now. got like I've got like a whole bottle left, so we can finish it next time, bro. That's what I'm saying, man. I can come in next time. Hundred percent, hundred percent, bro. Big love. Right, thank you so much for joining me, man. I really appreciate it. And thanks for no, everyone thank that's you. been. And you time. know, when when you hit me up, and I and you know, I said to you, I'm, I'm kind of oversaturated with interviews and shit like that. Yeah. And then I was walked away. I was like, no, I've got to do it for you, man. You know, oh. um, got a lot of respect for you and. uh you always do the right thing. So I was, I remember I messaged you back. I was like, no, I'm going to do it. Oh, and he's like, you know what I'm saying? So I'm glad I did do it. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, bro. It means a lot, man. Especially from you, man. Thank you so much, bro. Big love. Take care. Big up, man. See you again soon. Yeah, stay well, bro. See you in a bit. Bye.